We have today wonderful four main themes. The first theme, as you find in the brochure, assessing North Korea's nuclear capability. Regional or international reactions will be delivered by four experts. And we have a basic rule that each every speaker will make a 12 or 13 minutes presentation and I will enforce them with my iron fist. <laughs> yeah, 매우 중요합니다. 모든 연사는 12분의 발언 시간을 잘 지켜 주시기 바라고요. And please please take consideration that we have tomorrow a round table to talk relatively freely on all the issues. So, <clears throat> our first speaker is Mr. Daryl G. Campbell. He is the executive director of the Arm Control Association and publisher and contributor for the organization's monthly journal, Arms Control Today. Mr. Campbell, please. 박수로 맞아주시기 바랍니다. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Uh, my organization, the Arms Control Association, has worked very closely with the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops and uh, leaders from the Vatican for many years, long before I joined the Arms Control Association as executive director in 2001. So I'm very pleased to be here to provide an opening assessment of North Korea's growing nuclear and missile capabilities. For more than three decades, North Korea's nuclear weapons ambitions have posed a major foreign policy challenge for U.S. presidents and for the international community. On and off diplomacy efforts to address the North Korean safeguards and nuclear nonproliferation treaty violations and to rein in its nuclear capabilities have, over the years, yielded some important but limited results. And although these diplomatic efforts and sanctions have slowed North Korea's nuclear program, it has built up a small but very dangerous weapon stockpile and an increasingly sophisticated ballistic missile arsenal. Today, North Korean nuclear-armed ballistic missiles could strike targets in Northeast Asia, and some North Korean ICBMs armed with nuclear weapons may have the range necessary to reach some targets even in the United States, but with an uncertain degree of target accuracy. So to talk about and assess these capabilities, I want to just review briefly some of the recent developments over the past five years or so, the interrelationship between North Korea's nuclear and missile programs and efforts at diplomacy, particularly by the United States. In 2017, as you all will recall, after a series of dangerous and escalatory threats on the part of US President Donald Trump, the fire and fury threats, and from North Korea, uh, all in response to North Korean ballistic missile tests, uh, we came very close to a conflict that could have led to nuclear war. North Korea had just previously tested long-range Hwasong-14 and Hwasong-15 intercontinental ballistic missiles, its first uh, of its kind in 2017. But shortly after this, President Trump accepted a South Korean brokered invitation to meet with North Korea's leader, Chairman Kim uh, Jeremy Kim in 2018. Uh, Trump and Kim agreed at their 2018 summit in Singapore to transform U.S.-North Korean relations and try to build peace and security in the region and to denuclearize the Korean Peninsula. North Korea announced a voluntary pause in its nuclear testing and its long-range ballistic missile flight testing, and the United States reciprocated with uh, by scaling back military exercises with the Republic of Korea. Now, the first summit yielded limited but some important results, um, but afterwards it failed to lead to sustained progress. And when Tr Trump and Kim met for a second summit in Hanoi in 2019, they could not agree on concrete steps that would lead to peace and denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula. And I would say this was due to inflexible positions on the part of both sides, mixed messages, and maximalist positions put forward 
particularly by the Trump administration uh, and to some degree also by North Korea. Now, over this time, since North Korea has paused its nuclear and ballistic, long-range ballistic missile testing, it has been prevented from making certain qualitative advances, improvements to its capabilities, but at the same time, it's continued to produce the material for nuclear weapons, fissile material. Uh, it has resumed testing of short and intermediate range ballistic missiles, and it's also likely continued to produce additional numbers of already tested types of ballistic missiles. As a result of the absence of sustained diplomacy on peace and disarmament, North Korea's capabilities continue to expand every day. Today it's estimated that North Korea has enough nuclear material to produce as many as 40 to 50 nuclear warheads, although the exact number is not precisely known. Uh, we also know that North Korea has the capacity to produce highly enriched uranium uh, at at least two uranium enrichment facilities, and it continues to have the capacity to produce plutonium for nuclear weapons. It also, with respect to long-range ballistic missiles, um, has continued to test, uh, as I said, short and intermediate range missiles. And this conference, I must congratulate you all, is very well timed because just on Tuesday, uh, North Korea, of course, conducted a second test of an intermediate range uh, missile, the Hwasong-12, um, which has raised alarms about the possibility it might resume long range ballistic missile testing. The other thing it has done uh, over the last uh, three or so years, it has developed the capability to uh, produce ballistic missiles with solid fuel as opposed to liquid fuel. This means that North Korea can more rapidly launch these nuclear-armed ballistic missiles. Liquid-fueled rockets take longer to prepare for launch. Uh, some of these uh, missiles, <coughs> uh, particularly uh, three shorter-range missiles, the KN-23, 24, and 25, have uh, maneuverability characteristics that make it much harder to shoot down. So even though the ballistic missile flight testing has ended, North Korea's capabilities have uh, improved significantly. Now it should also be noted that South Korea at the same time has continued to develop its own ballistic missile uh, capabilities. Uh, uh, for example, in 2020, uh, the Republic of Korea conducted two tests of the new solid-fueled Hyunmo 4, which has a 800 kilometer range and an estimated payload of two metric tons. So there is, as we speak, a de facto ballistic missile arms race underway on the Korean Peninsula. Of course, North Korea being much more energetic uh, in this regard and its missiles are armed with nuclear weapons. We also have to be aware of what nuclear testing, nuclear test explosions do. Uh, as we all know, North Korea has conducted six nuclear weapons tests between 2006 and 2017. The detonation in 2017 was very large, around 100 kilotons TNT equivalent. Uh, to put that in perspective, the bomb that destroyed Hiroshima on August 6, 1945 was around 15 kilotons TNT equivalent. So this strongly suggests that North Korea has successfully tested a compact but high yield nuclear device that can be launched on intermediate or intercontinental range ballistic missiles. An additional nuclear testing would help North Korea perfect a smaller, lighter type of warhead that could be delivered longer distances. And there is concern right now that uh, new activity at the Pongyun-ri test site in North Korea uh, could be a prelude to a seventh nuclear test explosion. Now, let me just also note that North Korea recently updated its uh, nuclear policy. Uh, in September, Kim Jong-un announced a new law outlining uh, North Korea's nuclear posture. It reaffirms much of what we know, but what it says is very disconcerting. It states that, quote, the nuclear forces of the DPRK are a powerful means for defending the sovereignty, territorial integrity, and fundamental interests of the state, closed quote. Uh, North Korea's new law also asserts that North Korea's leaders have a right to, quote, use preemptive nuclear strikes to protect itself. And this reinforces our longstanding belief uh, 
that North Korea might use or would use nuclear weapons early in a conflict against the Republic of Korea, against the United States, um, uh, I'm sorry, against the ROK, against Japan, uh, and other targets if it believes it's under attack uh, from the outside. So let me just conclude with some thoughts about what the implications of these capabilities are, what some of the next steps uh, might need to be with respect to uh, US ROK uh, diplomacy vis-a-vis -vis North Korea. So the bottom line in my view is that North Korea's nuclear and missile capabilities remain extremely dangerous to the region and the danger is gradually growing. Uh, the policy of tighter and tighter sanctions uh, is not by itself constraining North Korea's behavior. Uh, and South Korea risks an accelerating missile arms race by pursuing its own capabilities. Without a lasting freeze of North Korea's missile and nuclear programs and restraint on the part of the Republic of Korea, Pyongyang's capabilities will increase and may soon pose a serious threat to the mainland United States, which has implications for the defensive arrangements between the United States and the Republic of Korea if a conflict breaks out on the peninsula. So obviously, diplomacy requires an interest in good faith on both sides. But to kickstart diplomacy again with North Korea, which has now been dormant since 2019, the Biden administration can and should do more than simply continue to express a willingness to engage in talks anywhere and any time. That in itself is good, but it's not enough. Now, our President Joe Biden, of course, has a great deal on his mind, uh, many crises to manage right now, obviously, but uh, President Biden and his team can and should, in my view, signal privately and publicly that it is prepared to pursue a principled but flexible step-for-step -step approach that rewards concrete steps towards denuclearization with meaningful and calibrated sanctions relief and mutual confidence building steps that simultaneously reduce tensions on the peninsula and the risk of conflict. And that it would be helpful if President Biden also signaled publicly that he recognizes that North Korea has security concerns and is willing to engage with Kim Jong-un and his team on those issues. We also need to understand that rapid elimination of all nuclear uh, and missile capabilities in North Korea and the, the uh, demilitarization of the facilities uh, relating to the nuclear program prior to Pyongyang receiving any sanctions relief, which is the process proposed essentially by the Trump administration at the Hanoi summit, is an unrealistic and unworkable approach. Instead, to manage and reduce and eliminate the growing risks, the US and its partners first need to focus on a freeze and to dismantle the most dangerous elements of North Korea's nuclear and missile program and continue to work over time to sustain the process for denuclearization and peace over time. So thank you very much. Let me end there. And I look forward to listening to the other panelists.